Hey, nerdy knitters. Welcome to another edition of the Knitting 411 podcast, where we answer your knitting questions. Today, we're diving into a brand new topic. We are going to cover all of the ways you can sew or join knitted pieces of fabric together. Today, we're going to focus on mattress stitch and three different ways, stitches to stitches, rows to rows, and stitches to rows. So there's a lot to cover with that. Plus, we'll be answering your questions live on the air if you... <laughs> live in this video if you have any questions for um for me about knitting or anything knitting related you can pop them right in the chat and we will answer them today we will start with our knitting news while some people are starting to join us now i don't know if you've ever heard of the book called 100 the 100 mile diet i believe it was a canadian couple I can't remember. I read it such a long time ago. Um, it was about, uh, they, they spent a year just eating locally grown or raised or sourced food that was with 100 miles of their home. And I thought that was pretty neat. And then I ran across this article about something called the 100 mile blazer. And a designer had the idea to source everything he would need, the dye, the yarn, the weaving, all of the processes to knit a, a garment uh, or to create a garment. It's not a knitted garment, but it does use yarn. Um, all of the things needed for that within a 100 mile radius. He's located in Toronto, so he stuck to a 100 mile radius of the Toronto area. So I've got the link there. You'll find it down in the video description box. It's a really interesting article. You can go and see a picture of the, the finished blazer. Um, so this Toronto designer, his name is Smythe, it's part of the Holt Renfrew, it's a department here, a store, or a brand here in Canada, um, and it's part of the Campaign for Wool, which is uh, something that the Prince of Wales is a patron of. Um, it's to raise awareness for wool, and it's renew as a renewable resource, and Everything that, of course, we as knitters know and love and appreciate about wool, but a lot of the world might not know. So it's to raise awareness for that. But um, so the goal of this project was to educate consumers with the benefits of wool and to help revitalize Canada's domestic wool industry, because we have sheep here. Um, so it started with, I'm going to walk you through the five different things that you'll find in this article as well, but I just thought it was really interesting. It started with the wool, obviously, and you can see a picture of the sheep right there. Um, and these sheep are from Pine Hollow Farm near Norwood, Ontario. So that's within that 100 mile radius of Toronto. Now the, the specific sheep breed, it's a pure breed cross flock called Norbalay. It's a mix of a Rambouillet sheep, which is a cousin to the Merino sheep, so we know that's going to be soft wool, crossed with a Romney, and then, which is a breed that originates in England, and then a third sheep, but that one is a secret, I guess. They, did, they don't say the other breed in there. So this is the Norbouillet sheep. So it started with the wool. So the, the woman who owns these sheep, she um, had their fleece cut off and removed. And then the fleece was sent to a mill, Hancock's Wellington Fibers in Alora, Ontario, and they spun it into yarn. And it took five days from washing to spinning to get all of that done. And then that yarn was sent to be dyed to at the Iron Cauldron Color Works in Toronto. And I, um, in the article, it says it was about 80 pounds of yarn, and it took him a month to dye all of it. So this is really a big process. If you think, of course, we know how long it takes us to knit a garment. But when you think of clothing in general, when you've got to source all of the, the resources, the wool and then get it spun, that took five days. And of course, the time it takes to dye it, which in this case was a month long for 80 pounds of wool. And then after it was dyed, it was sent to be woven into its final fabric, which was going to be a herringbone tweed cloth. Um, a weaver based in Toronto. Her name was Deborah Livingston Lowe, and she's also the manager of the project. Um, and she was keeping track of how long it would take her to do. So it was the equivalent of if with her loom, she's got the treadle type loom. I'm, I don't know much about looms, but the type she has has treadles. And she estimates that it was the equivalent of walking 66 kilometers to make all of the fabric. So after that fabric was created, of course, it went back to the designer, um, Smythe, and it was 
turned into its final garment. So I just thought that was really interesting to see all of the steps in the process to create a wool garment. And if you'd like to read that article, of course, I've linked it down below. So before we get to your knitting questions, I'll just stop and say, hey, Kaz is here. It's so great to see you. You haven't been here in a while. I've missed you. It's good to see you. And you've been knitting dishcloth mats for your local cafe. Oh, that's great. And your husband, Rob, your husband knits too on a round loom blanket for beds and you're putting them together. Oh, wow. You guys are busy. And you love to knit stripes blanket with different colored yarn. Uh, I'm not familiar with King Cole yarns. Well, you could always pick your own combination and make your own blanket. Um, let me think. If you need a pattern, Pearl Soho has some really simple but really pretty striped blankets. I can't remember the names of them, but if you go to pearlsoho.com and just type blanket in the search bar, you'll probably get a lot of choices there. I love to pick and choose my colors, or but sometimes those self-striping yarns are great too because everything's done for you and there's a lot less to weave in at the end. But I've been knitting a blanket too. Um, last week I talked about uh, a sweet lady at church. She left a bag of yarn in the pew where I was sitting. I wasn't at there at the time and I went back and I saw it and I figured it was from her. Um, and it had um, some of that ruffle scarf yarn. So I knit those up a few weeks ago and I took them back to church and gave them all away. And there was also some cotton chenille yarn in there, about 10 skeins of it. Oh, it's going to try to take this back so you can see it. But so I, I knit a blanket with it. I did not put the pattern. I'll put the pattern after the video down in the link. It's a free pattern. I think it's a Lion Brand pattern. Um, the original was a baby blanket. But I figured I would start with that and then just keep going until I had um, what I like. You start sort of like one of those um, corner to corner dishcloths. You start at one tip. Oh, that's the wrong side. Right here. You start at one tip and then you increase along both edges. So it's got it's garter stitch and then it's got sections of just simple eyelet and then more garter stitch. Really, really simple. So you're increasing at both edges until you want it as, as wide as you like, or well, the pattern had a certain number of stitches and then you start decreasing. But instead of decreasing, I maintain the edges. So I would still work my yarn over. So it took me a while to sort this out. I had to work a few rows to get my brain around it because I still wanted the little edging, the little yarn overs along the edge, but I didn't want the, the increases, but I wanted it to stay straight. So it took me a few minutes to and a few rows to figure out how to, I'd still work the yarn over at the beginning. Then I worked a knit three together to get rid of both yarn overs and to keep that line going on the bias. Cause it's sort of after you increase, you have to keep it going on a, on the bias. So you have to take a stitch away from one side, but add a stitch to the other side. So it worked out in the end. And then when I got to um, the final few skeins, I started decreasing again. So it's just a nice little lap blanket, just a chenille, soft cotton. So washable, chuck it in there and chuck it on my couch. And hopefully my dog won't steal this one. She likes to take all the blankets and nest on them. And then they're covered in her white dog fur. We have a beagle. She's sleeping right over here right now. Um, so that's all I've been knitting. My master knitting sweater is still on hold. I have been checking knit picks every single day to see when, because I'm using their bare uh, wool of Andy's worsted yarn um, to see when it would be back in stock and nothing, nothing forever. And then a few days ago, it says that it will be sometime in the middle of November. I can't remember the date now. So my first thought was, oh, I've got to wait a month. And then however long it comes takes to get here. So I, for about two seconds, I considered um, choosing a different yarn. But I've already knit almost the whole back of the sweater. Um, and if I choose a different yarn, I have to start from zero. I have to swatch. Like I have to knit all of the cables, swatches again, and everything, and do all my measurements again. So thinking of all of that work to do that just because this yarn is on hold, I'm just going to wait. So. I have other things I can work on. I have a few designs that are going to be coming out in the upcoming months. So the yarn for one of them is here. I'll show you that right now because I don't have anything else on my needles right now except for this. This. 
these yarns. Pretty, pretty colors. I don't think they, this one I think is um, available, but this one is not yet. Um, these are Biscott yarns. It's a local yarn shop here in, well, not local to me. It's a few hours for me. It's in Quebec. It's um, a blend of, it's a sock yarn. It's a blend of nylon, merino, and alpaca. So it's really so soft and lovely. So right now I'm swatching this to get my final uh, needles that I want to use for the fabric and make sure everything is sorted out and then I'll cast on. It's going to become, these two will become an infinity scarf um, that will, you can double and wear around your neck. So it'll have some stripes and some texture and lots of fun and just very pretty, pretty colors. I really like them. So that's, well, I've started on this watch. There's not much to see at the moment. Um, so that's the only thing on my needles right now. There's nothing else for knitting to talk about. So I'm going to show you the book that I'm recommending this week to go along with our topic of seaming. You can see all my little swatches up here. We're going to be diving into that in a little bit. But um, this book, The Knowledgeable Knitter. Now, Margaret Radcliffe has a bunch of different books. She's got um, the, a little square book called The Knitting Answer Book. That one is really great for quick answers or for... Um, really it's good for beginner knitters because it's really it covers a lot of the basic things but I like it too because it's really small and if I know I need to find a reference for something I can chuck it right in my knitting bag and it doesn't take up much space but she also has the circular knitting workshop which I have here on my shelf and the color knitting techniques book which is really great and also this one the knowledgeable knitter now this one I find it's um I would categorize it as one of those books for garment knitters who want to modify or really finish their garments well. Um, there's no patterns. It is just knitting, um, like walking you through what you would do to knit a pattern, like starting with your the pattern itself. Oh, there we go. Um, the yarn and the needle selections, all about gauge, taking proper measurements, choosing the right size, and then planning the project. Because there's, if you want a garment to fit well, like I wouldn't do this for a shawl or a dishcloth or something, but for a garment, I am going to take some time to make sure I'm using a cast on I like, that the pattern stitches are centered. She covers all of that in here. And then a great section on modifying the pattern. So if you're one of those knitters who cast on a pattern and then you start to make changes this is such a good reference like she has so much in here and then shaping and fitting and there's even more um understanding instructions making adjust adjustments and finishing practices orders and bindings and embellishments like there is just so much in this book and it's sort of thicker pages it's really nice and glossy and lots of great pictures and swatches and charts Lots and lots of swatches and examples. Steaking, different steaking methods. Oh, converting pattern stitches from flat to circular or the other way. I know that's a common question or converting garment instructions from flat to circular. So she covers a lot of, a lot of things that I often see questions about. So it's just a really, really good book. So if you're a sweater knitter and you want to really finesse your knitting and refine it, then this is a really good book. I like to sit and just read this one because I'm always pulling out something new that I hadn't considered before. So that is a good resource, my resource for the week. Okay, so I haven't been knitting anything else. I've finished that blanket and I started on this infinity scarf. I have some yarn coming. I will be casting on another design for the Knitting Guild Association's Cast On magazine, the upcoming February edition, um, the spring 2022. It's going to be a twisted stitch um, poncho, capelet. It doesn't, it's not open. You pull it over your head. So I guess a poncho is the right word for that. So that is everything that I've been knitting. As you're busy in the comments. Good to see you there. You're in England. Yes. Your 18 year old daughter. My daughter's 18 too. 
and she's crocheting. Oh, that's awesome. My daughter's not, she likes to watch me knit, but she's not interested. She's thought about doing crochet because she loves all the little amigurumi, the little figurines and things like that. So um, maybe she'll start doing that. She's really into art. She loves to draw. So that, that is her creative outlet. Okay. Um, so before we move into knitting questions and our community questions, I wanted to address, we have had a lot of back and forth about this class, um, about fixing your knitting mistakes and reading your stitches too, because they sort of go hand in hand. And um, it's sort of evolved and evolved. It was going to be a, like a two week challenge and that was too long. So then I thought maybe if we can condense it into one week and daily Zoom sessions. But some of the feedback I've been getting is about time like the time factor, um, asking somebody to show up every day for an hour on a daily schedule for something like this is a bit much. I mean, people work, people have other activities. So I've been brainstorming other ideas and I'd love your input about which option you think would be the most useful for you. All three of them would include sort of like homework swatches, like the instructions for them. So you could cast on and make these little swatches and practice the things that we'd be covering in the videos. And every option would include the exact same content. I already have like a, a rough outline of what we would cover um, and the different sessions. So the first option is the one that we had settled or I'd settled on before would be a daily one hour Zoom for a week. You'd have little homework swatches that shouldn't take you any more than half an hour to knit them um, before the next session. But like I said, it's a time factor. A lot of people don't wanna devote you know, an hour every day plus time to knit the swatch to, to make sure they're there for the session. And even though you could watch them, um, the recorded sessions after if you missed the live. Um, but the second option I thought would be I could just I already have the content like outlined. I just would have to make the videos. I could pre-record them like I would for YouTube videos. But these would be private videos that only you would have access to if you're part of the course. And you would still do those little swatches so you can practice and you can do them along with me. Like I will demonstrate the different mistakes and how to drop down and fix different things like lace and rib or garter stitch or all of those things. So you could knit the swatch and you could follow along and do it with me. That would be the self-study option. Then the third option would be sort of like a combination of the two. You'd still have your swatches to practice and you'd still have the pre-recorded videos. But then like maybe a week after that session, we would do a live stream like this where, uh, but it would be private only for people who were part of that self-study program where they could ask any questions they have and get their questions answered. So those are the three options we're at right now before I narrow it down to one. I need some feedback and I'd love to know which one would suit you best. If this is a, a little course that you would like to take, it would still be um, videos. It would probably be four or five different videos you'd watch, but you could watch them on your own if we didn't do the, the, um, the first option. So whatever is interesting to you, I'd love to know. I'd love to know which option would suit you best because I'd like to create something that's helpful. And learning to read your stitches. I know knitters say that all the time, but it really is an important thing because it's, it's an, I mean, you have to learn to count what's happening on your needles or, or if you make a mistake, how to fix it. If you can't read what's on your needles already, then you're not going to be able to fix mistakes. And then when you start to advance and do other things like brioche or cables, um, lace, all of those things, if you can't, if you haven't covered the base of, basics of reading your stitches, then those mistakes are, will be even harder to fix. So um, just let me know which option would suit you best. And we will move on to our community question from last week. Um, was about knitting gifts. I know a lot of people knit gifts, but a lot of people don't because they have had bad experiences and we had a lot of comments about that. You can see there some had great experiences. There's a lot of sweet messages and some, oh, one, a lady had um, made a beautiful shawl and her friend gushed over it. So she gave it to her friend. And then when she went to visit, it was in the dog's dog bed. So yeah, that would, that would kind of make me a little angry too. <laughs> um, 
So I'd love to know your experiences with knitting gifts, if you knit them, who you knit them for, who you find knit worthy. I love to knit gifts. Um, I'm not super attached to my knitting once it's off the needles and I'm on to the next thing. Maybe that makes me a process knitter. I don't know. Um, I'm okay with however people, what they want to do with it. I do try to make sure they know how to care for it so they don't end up felting it and shrinking it if it was an all wool type project. Um, but yeah, I usually, I knit for other people as gifts. I haven't run into much. I've only had a few people ask to knit specific things. And I usually tell them that would it be, it's usually like a picture of a sweater they see on Facebook or somewhere. What it, and they'll, they'll ask, Oh, could you knit this? And I'm like, it would be cheaper to buy it <laughs> because you know, um, it takes a lot of time to knit a sweater. Anyway, if you have experiences or stories to share about your gift knitting, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to go over and answer that community question, I left a link down below for that too. So we're going to dive right into our topic for the week, which is about joining our knitting. Now I say joining because you can join things in different ways. You can seam pieces that are bound off already or you can join pieces that have not been bound off yet where the stitches are still live on your needle, then you could graft them together. You could use a three needle bind off. So here are some of the methods. Um, today we're going to focus on bound off pieces. Um, but I've got little swatches here to demonstrate those. So we're going to show how to um, join, you can see right there a little swatch, how to join these different pieces together. And I'm going to focus on um, mattress stitch today because that is my preferred method. Um, the other ones I've listed here, I've looked through all my technique books. These are the most common that I found, mattress stitch, back stitch, overcasting, and slip stitch crochet. All of the other ones are similar to a sewing technique. If you've ever sewn anything, and then you know you have to put the right sides together and sew them and then you can turn it so the seams on the inside and you can see the front of your fabric but with mattress stitch the front of your knitted fabric is always facing you so as you're making your seam you can make sure things are looking correct if you're using one of the other methods then you're not able to see the right side of your work because those edges are the right sides are facing each other so you can seam them together. So that's why it's my preferred method. I, I don't have much experience with the other methods because I just I haven't used them very much. So I'm going to have to practice those before our next live stream so I can demonstrate them for you. But I do have some experience with mattress stitch. Level two of the master hand knitting program was really focused on that. I've got some of my swatches from the program right here. And oh, one little embarrassing secret. When I sent back level two, um, there are a whole bunch of different seaming swatches, like seaming stockinette, reverse stockinette, seed stitch, one by one rib, two by two rib, and then like um, shoulder seams, bound off edges, and lots of different things. And I had to, I had to resubmit almost all of my seaming swatches because I did a really bad job. They weren't done very well. So it takes practice. Um, so I have included um, a link. I don't know. I don't know if I put it in the video description box. I will do it after this live stream is over to that video right there by Suzanne Bryan, where she has created a whole like half hour tutorial that walks you through all of these methods and even has little swatches so you can make your own swatches and practice. I really encourage you to do that if you're going to knit a sweater where you have to seam the pieces together, which I encourage you to do as well because they just fit really well. They fit better than like sweaters that are knit in the round from the top down, which can end up like with a weird twist or bias. Um, when you seam the pieces together, you keep them in their place and they hold their shape a lot better. So I encourage you to learn how to do that. And we were, we're going to cover that today. I just wanted to cover, um, we we're going to cover those other seaming methods. We'll focus on mattress stitch and we're going to focus today on the bound off pieces um, where you uh, seam rows to rows or stitches to stitches or stitches to rows. So there's a lot to cover here, surprisingly. And um, after we cover that, in the next session, we'll, we'll cover the other methods for seaming. And then we're going to move on to that other section there, joining knitted pieces where the stitches are still live and the different ways you can do that. I do have a few tips, though. Before you start seaming, 
block your pieces. And by that, I mean, however you're going to treat your final garment, you're going to wash it the same. You're going to wash your, your pieces the same way. And you're going to pin them out. I like to look at my um, schematic or whatever I'm using, whatever the pattern it usually has the measurements on there somewhere, the finished measurements. And with the schematic, you can see all of the measurements. So I like to get out my tape measure and actually pin out my pieces to the measurements for my size and being careful with those edge stitches that they're try as flat as possible and not curled under. It just makes seeming a lot easier if your piece, pieces aren't curled or up. You can really see each, how they all line up, all of the rows and the stitches. Um, and if you have locking stitch markers, those are really useful, especially when you're seaming like from the bottom of a sweater up to the underarm and then down to the sleeve. That's a long section to seam. Um, so you'd want to cut, you don't want to have one giant piece of yarn that you're using to seam. I do use, I usually use the same yarn that I'm using that I knit the sweater in most of the time that works just fine. Um, but maybe 12 to 18 inch length of yarn at a time for seaming. Um, and oh, the stitch markers. I like to lay everything out and then I would use, like say it was for a sweater that starts at the underarm and then goes or starts at the, the bottom hem and goes to the underarm and then out to the sleeve cuff, I would put locking stitch markers at those three places. And then periodically in each section, sort of line things up like you would do if you were going to sew something together, use some straight pins. It's the same sort of thing, but with locking stitch markers, just so things line up. Because sometimes you might have, especially if you're knitting in a plain stitch pattern like stockinette, where you might end up with a couple extra rows on the back instead of the front or something. So you can like fudge that a little bit in your seams. Um, what else? Oh, and weaving in your ends. Um, I don't do that before I seam either because it's really easy, especially if your ends are at the edges, you can just run them right up in the, in the seam and hide them there. So you don't have to even really weave them in. And sometimes they can get in the way if you're, if they're along the edge, they can get in the way of the seaming process. So those are my only tips. Okay, so we're going to move in to the demonstration for this. Um, looking at my notes here real quick to make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, one more tip I didn't have on here. Um, no matter what stitch pattern you're using, you can use mattress stitch with um, different stitch patterns. I'll show you my swatches here in a second. But my preference is to do them with stockinette because it's just so much easier to see a stockinette little V stitch. So um, whenever you're knitting something and you have to do a seam with it, you don't have to put the stitch pattern all the way right to the edge. You can have like a one stitch, selvage stitch at the side. And I like to work mine in stockinette. And that just makes it really, really simple. Okay, so I'm gonna move into the overhead camera and we're gonna look at these three methods. All right, we'll start with some of the, these are all mattress stitch swatches. Get that closer. So you can't, if I pull it apart, you can see where it's sort of joined in the middle. And I've even used a different color of thread. So it just makes your finished project look almost seamless. It's more obvious in reverse stockinette. Now the technique is a little bit different in reverse stockinette. You're sort of joining your smiles and frowns as you go. But I think even if I had to do a reverse stockinette fabric, I would still do a selvage stitch in stockinette just to make it easier. Because it's a little more noticeable, I think, in that fabric. You can make them even in seed stitch. Oh, this one was one that did not pass. I did a terrible job of my, <laughs> my um, you can see the, the bulk of the seam right there. My knit one pearl one rib was not very good. And we're also going to look at this where you are seaming stitches to rows where you've got fabric going in different directions here and how you would work that, um, which is sort of a combination of the other two methods that we're going to discuss today. And there's that seam along the back. So there's a few examples of what we'll look at today. Okay, so we'll start with the most basic, which is rows to rows. We're going in this direction and combining and connecting rows. I'm gonna to try to move my camera in a little bit here so you can see what I'm doing. There. All right, so I'm going to use this. These swatches are in bulky yarn. I'm gonna use bulky yarn 
the same kind of yarn, just a different color. And you'll need a tapestry needle. This is bulky yarn, so I hope I have one that is big enough. I think I do. And I prefer, I should put a link for these two down there. I think I got these at Knitpicks. These, um, they have like a bent tip. I just, I prefer these for weaving in ends and for seaming. I just think they're a lot easier. So you're going to take your length of yarn that you're seaming with and thread it onto your needle. And before you can start doing a mattress stitch, you do something called a figure eight join. It's one way to join the pieces together. And it's really simple. Um, first, you have to know what you're looking at. You have to be able to read your stitches. We can have, we see our columns of stitches. All of these V's are stitches and there's columns of stitches. And this wonky column over here and this wonky column here, that's our salvage edge. Those are the stitches that will be hidden in the seam. And the, the stitch right beside them, right there and right there, those are the stitches that will be seen when they're seamed up. Like you can't see our salvage stitches here. They're hidden on that side. Those are the stitches to either side of the salvage that you'll see here. So what you do is you're going to, if you pull your knitting apart, you can see there's little bars. That's just the running thread that goes between each stitch and connects them all. That's what we're gonna to use to do our seam with. So we're going to be connecting right in that little ditch between that selvage and that first column. And we're going to be connecting it to this little ditch between this selvage column and this row of stitches. So you start with a figure eight seam. You can start with either one. We wanna start right at the bottom along that cast on edge. So we look at our salvage column and we're going to just insert under both legs between those two columns. So we've got our salvage column here. Get in focus, sorry. We've got our salvage column. It is still, I, I steamed these a little bit because they're acrylic, so I can't really lock them, but, I, um, but it's still curling to the back. I think you can still see there. So we've got this salvage row or column. And then this column, we want to put our needle as close to the cast on edge as possible between those two. So I like to come wiggle it around. There's the cast on edge right here. And I'm in between those two columns of stitches. So I'll pull my yarn through, but I'm going to leave a tail. You can weave that in later. You're going to repeat that on this piece coming from the front to the back. Just along that cast on edge between that selvage stitch. Oh, and you can see right there, if I pull it apart, we've got a little hole right there between those two, right there. And now to complete the figure eight, we go back into the same place on this piece. We've got a lot of yarn bits flying here. So, so. just try not to catch the, the seaming yarn because it will make it impossible to weave it in after. So you come in from behind again. And if you look at it, you can see it looks like a figure eight. That's why they call it a figure eight join. So you can tighten it up if you want just a little bit. So our pieces are joined. And then at this point, we finished on the right. So we're going to go back and forth. We go to the, we finished with the left piece, I should say. Let me move this in a little more. Okay, so what we, uh, our last thing we worked into was this left piece. So now we're going back to the right piece and we're gonna go back and forth between the two. And from this point on, it's really simple. You just wanna remember you're going to be in that little, that space between those two columns of stitches on each side and you're looking for that running bar. So you go in where your yarn is coming out of. That's where you go in and you can look for that running bar. It's right there. And you just bring your needle back to the front, catching that bar and that's catching that row. And then you move back to this side, pull it apart if you have to, you're not gonna hurt your knitting. You're right where that yarn is coming out and you're gonna go underneath that first bar and bring it up. Oh, I should have made a longer yarn. This is pretty short. Okay, and then we go back to this side, go back in where that yarn is, come up under the next bar, staying between these two columns of stitches. 
You see how in between the two columns, you stay right in there, catching a running bar. Now, some people can, like to catch two bars, but I just think it looks neat to catch one. You can get a bit messy if you're trying to catch too many bars. So we go in where that yarn's coming out, catch the next bar, come up. You just repeat this for the length of your fabric. Go in where that yarn is and come out under the next bar. And I can't really do much more because my yarn is a little too short. But as you progress and you get up a couple of inches, you can stop and you just basically pull them. And this is why you want to make sure that you're not um, accidentally putting your tapestry needle into your seaming yarn because it will get stuck and you won't be able to pull this. So if I pull it, it sort of zips it closed. We've got that bright orange yarn and where it seemed, you can't even tell that there's orange yarn unless I pull it apart and look at it. So that is mattress stitch. You're just working back and forth between those columns of stitches and that selvage stitch will go to the inside. You can already see along the bottom and our two pieces are joined right together right there. So that is basic mattress stitch between rows and rows. Then we move into something a little bit different where you have, say you're binding off two shoulders and you need to join the back and the front together. In this case, you're knitting, you're joining columns of stitches instead of rows of stitches. And you've got a cast on row and a bind off row. So this one is not the same because you're not using running bars or anything. You actually have to use the stitches. And we want to basically create a row of stitches in here. And this one, I always forget, I have to look because one of them, it's picking up, um, moving the needle between the stitches. And then the other one is like going down between, between the, into one stitch and up in another stitch. So I always have to, to help myself remember, I just sort of insert and play around with it. So I think like this is going to be the top one there. So I'm going to look, if I insert into the middle of a stitch, and come up in the middle of the next stitch. Now I'm, I'm assuming you know how to read a stitch. A stitch is a little V. So I have, if you look right there, I am, I went down into one stitch and coming up in another. So I'm between two Vs. If I pull this through and look at it, because I want to simulate another row of knitting, it's not another row of knitting. I've got a row a column to either side and I'm sort of like stuck in the middle. If I pinch it, it looks like a stitch by itself, but where it's placed doesn't look correct. So I know that's not right. So I know on my top piece, I have to go around the stitch to either side. Like if you look at my needle right now, I went under the left, the right leg of the stitch. Oh, come on, autofocus. <laughs> I went under the right leg of the stitch. There we go. And then I came out under the left leg. So I've got a stitch here. Now, if I pull it through and look at my yarn now, pulling it like it's gonna look like a stitch. Yeah, that looks like it's gonna be another little stitch and it's lined up with those stitches. So for my top piece, that is how I'm going to pick up each section. You're going to go in and out in the same part, but it will be around a stitch to either side of it. So that means for the bottom, or the front of our sweater, if this were two shoulders of a sweater. Let me show you first if I did it the same as the top piece where I'm going around a stitch. Now it's gonna go this way because my columns are going to, I want my column of stitch, stitches right there to look almost seamless. So if I pull that tight, that stitch is a mess. That's not how that's supposed to look. So on the bottom piece, I'm going to go into the middle of a stitch and up between the middle of the next stitch. Now, if we look at that one, because the yarn's gonna be pulled this way, huh, I'm not messing up my stitches. They still look okay. So that is how I try to remember which one is which. So on the bottom piece, you're inserting your needle into the middle of a stitch and coming up into the middle of the next stitch. On the top piece, you're going to be inserting to one side of a stitch and bringing it up on the other side of the stitch. So it's almost like you're, it's a bit of a jog actually by half a stitch because of the way they're sitting, 
because of the way the fabric is facing. We want that to look as seamless as possible. So we'll start with our bottom piece. We're going to start right at the edge. This is the one where we come up into the center of the stitches. So I'm going to do that right here. The, that's my selvage stitch. I'm coming up right into the center of it. Leave a little tail. And then we move to the top. And it's the same as mattress stitch. We go back and forth between the two pieces, just like you're sewing. And this one, I'm going to go under both legs. I'm going to catch that whole stitch and pull my yarn through, try to keep my tail out of the way. And then we just, it's sort of like mattress stitch at this point. You're going to go back in where you came out on your previous one. And on the bottom, it's between in the middle of a stitch. So I come up in the middle of this stitch right here. And then I go to the top, go down where that other yarn is, and we're going around the stitch this time on that piece. And then back in where the yarn is, back out between the two stitches or between a stitch. So it's the same idea, back and forth, go in where your yarn already is. On the top, it's around the stitch to the right leg and then under and to the left leg. And then on the bottom, back in where we were before, back up between that next column of stitches. Okay, I'll do a few more and then we'll look at this. lost my thread. I guess I'll stop there. All right. So if you continued right along, got a few here already, you can see it looks like, I'm going to tighten it up just a little bit. It looks like another row of knitting, very, <laughs> very loose row right now. And of course, it's in a totally different color than I would use. But it's lined up like it's just another column of stitches. So you can leave your your um, seam, your seaming thread exposed if you wanted to. The pieces are all joined right there on the back. So you don't have to zip it up. Like if you use the same color yarn and your stitches were the same side, you get a seamless join right here. You wouldn't see it like you do on um, the mattress stitch here, you can't see where the seam is. So if you leave it exposed on this one, you won't be able to see the seam. Of course, you're working in the same color, but you can also zip it up, but you will see, like you would see in a seam, like you would see the line where the pieces are joined. So it's not like quite so seamless, but um, seaming it this way keeps the, the columns of stitches continuous from one piece to another. So that is how you do uh, stitches to stitches. So say you're doing a shoulder seam or something like that. This example would be like the sides of a garment, the right side and the left side, the front to the back, the right, you know, the left back to the right front or something like that. Those would be your side seams and these would be your shoulder seams. And then we move into the last example of this, um, which is stitches to rows. So you're combining the two. So this happens when you want, um, say you're knitting, a, you're adding a sleeve to a sweater. So you've got the sleeve coming, you've got the body of the sweater. No, this is upside down. You've got the body of the sweater going in this direction, but then your sleeve stitches are coming, going to be joined in this direction. So you've got two different directions going on here. So the first thing I like to do, um, if it's something like a sleeve and it has to be set in and really exact, I find the center of both so I can line them up because my, well, I mean, my swatches are almost, are not the same length here. Um, if they were, then I, I would still find the center to, to make sure everything's looking right. Um, and then we have to think about our stitch gauge versus our row gauge because in our other two examples, we were going stitch by stitch and lining things up because there was no difference in gauge. We're 
doing one row to another row and they're, they're going to be exactly the same. But when it comes to stitches and rows, your gauge is different because knitted knit stitches are wider than they are tall. So you'll have um, fewer stitches to an inch than you will rows to an inch. That's why a pattern might say, oh, five stitches and seven rows to an inch or something like that. So of course the pattern will probably tell you how to seam and how many stitches to skip and all that. But that is with the understanding that your stitch gauge and row gauge are the exact same as the pattern instructions. And if they're not, then your pickup ratio will be different. So a simple way to do this is just when you're knitting and you've got your gauge swatch or you're, you've measured your garment, take, figure out the, the stitch and row gauge to one inch and that's just your ratio. In my example here, I think I did a, I did a quick calculation earlier. These are tiny little swatches. I don't recommend them for actually getting your gauge, but I think it was about four stitches to the inch and about five rows to the inch. So that tells me for every four stitches that I seam, I'm, sti I'm seaming five rows. So that's my ratio, four to five. So within that, somewhere in that five, I need to skip a stitch. And you wanna keep it about the same as you go across. Like you don't wanna keep varying where that's gonna be, especially, and you've, you've got the whole length of a sleeve cap to do or something like that. So in my case where I've got four to five, then I would um, probably seam two, skip one, seam two more, and then and then repeat that. Seam two, skip one, seam two. And that would place them approximately even. So I um, have two options here. If you had two pieces that were exactly the same length, then you would just line them up at the bottom and seam them up. But I'm simulating sort of like if you have a sweater sleeve that you have to make sure it's going to sit in there correctly. So I've placed some markers to tell me where approximate center is for these two little swatches. So I'm going to, um, on this piece, I'm doing mattress stitch still, like we did with our first swatch. I'm going to start right here in the middle, though, and just catch one of those running bars. And then that gives me the center and I'm going to work out in this direction and then work from the center out to that direction. And that will help me keep things lined up. If I were knitting a sleeve, if this is just two straight pieces, it really doesn't matter. So that is our first mattress stitch seam. So now I would start over here. I like to flip it a little. So we just did a shoulder to shoulder seam and we know on the bottom piece, we have to go into the center of a stitch and up through the next stitch. So that's what I'm going to do here. Keep my marker out of the way. Probably can take that one right out now. And then it's the mattress stitch seam. So we go back in where I was, look for that next running bar, bring my needle up. And then I'm up to the stitch it or the stitch right here in the center, come up through the next stitch. So that is two stitches seam. So I know I want to skip my next one. So I'm still putting my seaming yarn there, but oh wait, no, I did that wrong. What am I thinking? Oh yes, it's here. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. It's on this side that um, you want to catch that extra, the ratio. I'm going to be catching all of these along this edge, but it's the length of the, the fabric. Those rows, there's more of those than there are stitches going this way. So instead of catching one this time, I'm going to catch two bars. You could just skip a bar and go to the next bar. That's another choice. Either one works. And But then our stitches, I'm still going to work them the same way. Coming up where that one is, coming up in the next one. So I've skipped one and I'll go back to one bar at a time. And that's what the seam would look like. And this one you would want to probably zip right up so you don't see it. And then you would 
take your yarn and go in the other direction, remembering your ratio. You pick up or you seam two stitches here, and then I would like pick up two bars here instead of just one, or skip a bar and then back there. Whatever your ratio, then that's what you would um, use to determine how many stitches you would skip. So say your ratio is, or your, your, your gauge, you use that to figure out your ratio. So if your gauge is five stitches to the inch and seven rows to the inch, then you will pick up, you will combine five stitches and seven rows. So you would skip twice in that little section. You would have five stitches here and you would put pick up two extra bars two different times. There, I hope that is understandable and at least an introduction to that. Um, that video though that I think I have the link for it down below. If you want to practice this, and I encourage you to do it, I don't have a video about it, but Suzanne Bryan has one, and it covers all four of these things, or all three, all three of these methods, so you can get a really clear explanation of how those work, and then you'll be ready to knit your own seamed garment. Oh, let me get a quick drink. Oh, Kaz is still here chatting, and Lillian. Hi, Lillian. Nice to see you here. Okay, so that covers our discussion for the week. So that is mattress stitch, a basic overview of it. Next time, we were going to look at back stitch, overcasting, and slip stitch crochet, the three other methods. But mattress stitch is my preferred because you can see what you're doing from the front of the work. So when you pull, pull that um, seaming thread together and your seams come together, you can see if you've messed up or it looks messy, you can pick it out and redo it. It's harder to do when the right sides are facing each other and you've finished a seam and then you check the right side and it doesn't look good. So you have to pull it out. With mattress stitch, you can look as you go and make sure things are looking correct in the way you want them to. Okay, so our next session will cover those methods because they do have their uses as well. And then we're going to look at joining live stitches. Our, our examples today, all the stitches were bound off, but you don't have to bind off stitches. You can join them live. So we'll cover the basics of that as well in our next session. Now, before we wrap up for the day, we have a new community question. If you want to head over and answer it, you'll find the link down below. You can leave your comment down below or in the chat. Tell me your opinion about straight needles. Do you love straight needles? Do you hate them? Or are you ambivalent or other? <laughs> I started on little double pointed needles, my first project, because I did a washcloth and I was, um, my sister-in-law sent me to the store and told me what to buy. And I picked up that package and it had five needles in it. So I was like, oh, this is a great deal. I get five needles. Because in my mind, I only thought I needed two, but it wasn't until later that I realized you'd use all your double pointed needles to knit small things in the round. Um, but then my next set was a set of straight needles. And honestly, I didn't really love the way they kept hitting my arm when I was knitting. Maybe it's just the way I held them. I'm not sure. But then I got some circular needles and I knit almost everything between double points and circular needles. So you can go answer that. Tell me how you feel about straight needles. I have been meaning to explore like people who hold, they use the really long straight needles and they hold it under their arm. That looks really interesting. So if you do that, I'd love to hear about that and your experience and how that works for you. And we're about to wrap up here. Thank you for joining me, Kaz and Lillian and everybody else who didn't leave a comment in the chat. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you have questions for our next episode, which will be in two weeks, then you can leave them down below. Um, the video description box. You can leave a comment down there. If you're catching the replay, then leave a comment down below the video. Or if you're over on the community page of the Nerdy Knitting community YouTube page, then you can look for this picture. And the latest one I post, and I have the date for the, late, the next live stream, and you can leave your questions right there as well. And I always check all those places for new questions so that I can answer. And thank you for joining me today. And of course, thank you for your support for chatting and being with me today and hanging out. And if you like to get nerdy with your knitting, I'd love it if you'd subscribe, click that notification bell so you know when we're live streaming next time, which will be in two weeks.